Bozeman, Montana. It's a beautiful day. It's a little cool here, about 55 degrees, but we are going to uh, load up the four-wheelers, head up into the mountains, do some four-wheeling. Going to take a chance to introduce, or at least review, the time value of money. Good morning. Welcome to Cook City, Montana. This is basically right around Yellowstone Park in the mountains. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of four-wheeling, uh, enjoying our time here. It's a little bit chilly this morning. I think it's about 35 degrees and raining, which is unfortunate. I'd rather it be 30 degrees and snowing, actually. But this is what we got. It's supposed to break up here a little bit, get some sun. We'll be heading back out on the trail after breakfast. But I thought I'd take a moment, step outside here on the porch, talk to you about the time value of money. So, so welcome back. Uh, I had to move the camera. Actually, the computer died right as I was getting started before. So we moved up here, um, actually up a little bit above Cook City, Montana, and we're going to finish up our discussion of time value of money. So uh, basic concepts, time value of money. Time value of money is the relationship between time and money. This idea that um, a dollar that I have today is worth more than a dollar in the future. Therefore, if I were to give you a dollar for you to use in your business or for you to use whatever, to go buy a car, that the fact that I'm giving you that money today, you get to use it and I don't get to use it, I'm gonna charge you something for that ability that you have to use it, whereas when I, during the same time that I am not using it. So <clears throat> that concept is what we refer to as the time value of money and it's the basic relationship between time and money so that a dollar received today is worth more than a dollar promised at some time in, in the future. So this is when deciding among investments, someone with money that they don't want to consume, that they want to invest instead, <clears throat> that money, um, they're going to decide where to put it based on what their expected return is going to be. So how much do they expect to get back from giving someone else that dollar to use as opposed to them using it themselves? And that underlies essentially all, all of investments. It is a big concept within accounting as well. We use that routinely when we present a lot of uh, current figures or current amounts for things that we expect to happen in the future. So notes payable, notes receivable, leases, pension, post-retirement benefits that we're talking about cash that would, companies plan on spending potentially 30 or 40 years into the future, bringing those back to figure out, okay, well, what's our liability to our retirees now? That involves time value of money concepts. So we also use it for share-based compensation, business combinations, disclosures, environmental liabilities. It pops up a lot when as we work through our accounting. So that's why we need to have a pretty solid understanding of this and some basic understanding of how it gets calculated so that we can pull that into our models that we know, for instance, if if you're auditing some a company and you get a valuation model for a business combination, you have at least the ability to evaluate, okay, what are the main, uh, what are the main inputs to this? Are those reasonable? Um, so that's kind of a lot of the uses for it. Some basic concepts that we'll be going over, going through over and over again. There are three concepts, uh, principal, interest rate usually, um, and then the time. So the principal is merely the amount borrowed or invested. The interest rate is the cost or return of the money that's borrowed or lent. And it's stated as an annual percentage of the outstanding principal. So that's why we have, say, a 5, or 8, 10, 12% interest rate is representing the rate at which we are since loaning or borrowing the, the money or the principal. And then the time is just the amount of time that we're going to have access to this. So that whatever, that can be anywhere from a month to or multiple years, 30 years for a mortgage rate these days. So 
that's those are the basic concepts. So we want to start with our basic building blocks. We're going to start with simple interest. Now, this is a building block. This is not <clears throat> a concept that we're going to, or it's a concept we'll be using a lot. It's not the practically, this is not how it functions uh, when you actually start working, but it's a it's the basic principle. It's the building block of everything that comes after this. So with basic or simple, in, simple interest, interest is computed only on the principle and it's essentially just like that's it and that's how it keeps going so if we take an illustration say this company barstow electric borrows ten thousand dollars at a simple interest rate of eight percent per year so in the first year so again as we've mentioned before interest rates are always stated on an annual basis unless it indicates otherwise it is assumed to be annual so this eight percent interest rate it says per year it's assumed to be per year even if it didn't say that. So we have 8% per year. So if we they're borrowing $10,000 at a rate of 8%, to compute this, it's just $10,000 times 8% or 0 0.08 times one year, which is the year, the amount of time they're borrowing. So there's our, our basic, our basic um, building blocks of the principal, the interest rate, and the time. So we multiply all those together, that gives us an interest cost of $800 for that year. Now let's say we extended this for three years. They're still borrowing $10,000 at 8%, but now for three years. Under simple interest, they're only having to pay interest on the principal. So the calculation is $10,000 at 8% times three years, which is $2,400. Now that's if we were to go longer. What if they went shorter? Again, that 8% interest rate is per year. Now, if they're going shorter, let's say just three months, which would be a quarter of the year or three twelfths of the year. If they're only, if they're borrowing the money for only three twelfths of the year or a quarter of the year, we need to calculate instead of calculate it by one or for one year or three for three years, we calculate it by three twelfths for three of 12 months. So it's $10,000 times 8.08 times three twelfths, which gives us $200, which is a quarter of the $800 that they pay for the whole year. So that's how the, it can be shorter than a year. That's how that 8% interest calculation works. Now by federal law actually requires disclosures of interest rates by essentially banks to be disclosed on an annual basis. So again, everything is going to be on the annual basis, unless it explicitly says it's something different, which is very rare. So, um, <clears throat> If we take compound interest, so simple interest is a building block. Compound interest is what we actually use when we start working and start calculating this in actually the real world and practical uh, situations. So we still have the principal and the interest. So compound interest computes the amount or the, the cost of this money on the principal and interest that's been earned but hasn't yet been paid or withdrawn. So in that three-year period that we just talked about, let's assume they borrowed it for three years, it wouldn't just be times, it wouldn't just be the $10,000 that they borrowed for the three years. You're going to add interest into it every year if it's compounding annually. And that's when it, that's what's going to give you your total interest expense, which we'll see here in a minute. So the basic computation for compound interest is one plus the interest rate. So if the interest rate was say, um, 8%, it would be 1.08 um, raised to the N, which is the number of periods. So raised to the number of periods or the number of compounding periods. If it compounds annually, that's the number of years it's outstanding. Um, and then you multiply that times the principal, which gives you the, that's the calculation for the amount of compounding uh, or for compound interest. So if we work our same example, we had the company, they borrowed $10,000. We're going to say, we're going to say for three years at an interest rate of 8% per year, but it's now compounding annually, which means every year when they aren't paying interest, the amount of interest that they sh would have paid or the amount of interest that is accrued for that year goes into the principal. So that in year two, they're borrowing the initial principal plus the unpaid interest for the first year. So in our example, in the first year, nothing changes. They borrowed $10,000 at 8%. That means the annual interest rate was $800. The new principal balance now is $10,800. That new principal is what they're borrowing in the year two. So in year two, they're borrowing $10,800 at 8% interest for another year. So the interest cost in year two is not $800. It's actually $864 
which brings them to a new principal balance of $11,664. Now, the $11,664 is just the $10,800 plus the $864. So if you notice, in the year two, interest they're paying $64 more of interest. Well, that $64 is the cost of borrowing $800 in year two because they borrowed the $10,000 and they borrowed the $800 together. So that we move on to year three. We do the exact same thing. Their new principal balance that they're borrowing for year three is $11,664 at 8% for another year. And now the annual interest has grown to $933 in year three, which means the new principal balance is $12,597. Now, Think back, if you remember back to the simple interest calculation, at the end of year three, they would have only accrued what would have been, what, $2,400 worth of interest. Well, under comp under compounding interest, they've actually accrued uh, $2,597, almost $200 more interest accrued under compounding than it did under simple interest. So that is the difference between compounding and simple interest. Again, as we get into the application, when you get into how this gets applied in business context, it's always compound interest. If you borrow from a bank, they actually compound daily. So every single day, they're compounding your interest. So if you, if you, if you don't pay off your loan today, well, the amount of interest that you accrued today, you'll be paying interest on tomorrow. It compounds daily. So they're compounding over 365 days. So that is, that's how it works actually at the banking level. Now, as you move into um, like notes between companies or something, compounding usually shrinks down. That A lot of times that is merely from a simplicity standpoint as opposed to what they would actually want. So we're going to start working a lot of examples. Uh, what we're going to be using, what I'm going to use as I walk through the the examples in class or in this video, what I'm going to be using is the tables, the compound interest tables. Um, back in the day, these used to be in the back of your textbook. Um, I will generally make these available if I ask you questions like this in the future. Uh, practically speaking, it's going to make more sense for you to learn how to do this on your calculator. If you have a financial calculator that calculates interest, learn how to use it. Now, with that said, I don't know how to use your financial calculator. There's a dozen or so of good ones out there on the market. I don't know how they all work. I have one I use occasionally, but typically actually actually use my computer programs to do it. Again, because if I'm trying to compute daily interest rates, which I typically am, then the calculators actually don't work that well. They give you a good ballpark for practice, but they aren't uh, exact enough usually for application uh, in a business context. So we're going to be using these compound interest tables as I walk through it. So there's a number of tables. They t they, there's present value, future value tables, and then there's all the uh, annuity tables that we'll talk about annuities, which is a stream of cash flows. We'll talk about annuities a little bit later. So uh, again, to, to get this, you need the number of periods and the rate. And then you, that gives you a um, factor. You multiply the factor times the principal and that gives you what the value is, what the future or present value is um, of the amount that you're trying to uh, calculate. So we'll be using the tables. I like the tables because it lays it all out. It's You see exactly, okay, here's how things are changing over time. Here's my rate, here's my period, I just line it up. So the way they work is the typically down, say the first column will have the number of periods. So one, two, three, four, five, six, however long the money is compounding. Uh, and then across the top, you'll have your interest rate. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the period is assuming that's the compounding period and the rate is the compounding period rate. So if it's annual, it all makes sense. The period is year and the rate is whatever the rate is. Now, if something is say at a 12% interest, interest rate annually, but it's compounding, let's say quarterly, what you end up with actually is you have four compounding periods and you have four compounding periods, not at 12%, but at 3%, which is one quarter of 12, because you have four periods. So under this table, um, you'll be using the periods, will be the four periods, and your rate will actually be three, not one period for 12. That would be if it was compounding annually. If it's compounding quarterly, you need to basically divide everything by 
uh, four, and that's what you'll get. So your periods will go, actually you multiply your periods by four and you divide your interest rate by four. So your periods goes up to four periods compounding at 3%, which is an annual rate of 12% compounding quarterly. So that's roughly how they work. We'll walk through some examples here. <clears throat> Um, one thing to keep in mind, the more frequently the, the money is compounding, the higher, the more you're going to be paying because you're paying for basically the principal rate, principal that you're paying interest on is higher for each one of those periods. So if something's only compounding annually, well, your rate is exactly as it states. It's 12%. If it's compounding, say, uh, if we go down to monthly, your rate actually is going to be higher than 12% because unless you pay interest, every single month, which sometimes you do, if you if you don't pay interest every month and it just compounds, then you're going to actually end up paying more than 12% as if you did for 12% for the whole year. Go back to our example of the $10,000 again. And then back to if you're compounding daily, your effective rate is going to be much higher because you're not writing a check for the interest every single day. So every day you're borrowing a little bit more than you borrowed the day before until you pay it down at say the end of the month or the end of the quarter or the end of the year. <clears throat> so that's uh, compounding interest tables. So some uh, basic concepts, Tip typically we're gonna lay everything out in terms of basically kind of like a timeline. I encourage you when you're working problems, if you're getting turned around, lay it out in terms of a timeline. What information do you have? And then that helps show you, well, what information am I trying to figure out? So typically the timeline, we have the present value. That's the value that we have today. Sometimes we know the present value. In accounting, a lot of times the present value is what we're actually trying to calculate because we know the cash flows in the future. What we don't know is what they are today that we need to put on the financial statements. So most accounting time value problems are trying to calculate the present value. So that's the present value is what the money is worth today. The future value is what it's worth at whatever point we're talking about in the future. So if I'm, let's say I'm going to borrow money from you or let's, uh, well, let's say uh, we're trying to value a company. And what we do is we say, okay, well, what's the expected stream of cash flows of this company? Then what I'm going to do is I know the future value. I know my expected stream of cash flows. I need to figure out, okay, well, what's it worth today? Let's say I wanted to buy the company. Well, what's its present value? What's it worth today? Or what is what is this expected stream of cash flows in the future worth today? That future value is what the future cash flow is. So that's the future value. The interest rate is over that whole period. And then how long are we talking about here? How many periods are we dealing with? Those That's how we lay out our problems. So we're going to take a little break here. I'll come back and uh, we'll, wrap, we'll work through some of these problems. Um, in the meantime, uh, enjoy yourself and uh, I'll try to enjoy myself. Getting up on top here, uh, the weather's held off. It's just a little cloudy, but otherwise it's a beautiful day. We've got some beautiful views up here, just cruising along a little fogging road. Uh, comes up the side of this mountain.